Well, who'd have thought it? Our little old sport on video. I think it's a great idea because it lets us show you how these things are made, how they really perform, and how you can get the best out of them. Well, my producer's already given me the hurry up, so we'll cut back to September and the Midland Game Fair. Have a look at Airgun Expo 94 and watch out for sporting air rifle. Here at Western Park at the 94 Midland Game Fair, the accent is on participation. To cater for this, we've set up Sporting Air Rifle. Everyone gets to have a go. They try everything there is available of quality from the British air gun manufacturers. They're having a great time. They're trying out pre-charge, recoilless, spring guns. They're shooting at rats in waterfalls. They're shooting in tunnels. They're lamping. They're doing everything you can imagine with a rifle and enjoying themselves immensely. And I think the manufacturers are fairly pleased as well. When I when I heard about sporting air rifle, I thought of, you know, cheap air rifles, 50, 60 pound air rifles. I didn't realise air rifles have progressed so much. You know, there's rifles there with uh, 200 pound scopes on. There's air rifles there with 10 pound scopes on. There's kids shooting it, there's parents shooting it. It's diverse, it's attractive to all people. This is the first shoot of its kind and there will be many more to follow. Do you think we can incorporate it into the existing club network for air gun shooters? Oh, most certainly can. Most certainly can. I can see that. And I can see other, other situations can be involved with this as well, as far as like, um, ideal systems for training you know, youngsters coming in from forces point of view, from the, the cadet forces and such like. So how do you see the future, Bill? Do you, do you think organised air gun shooting is the future, or shall we just let the kids get on with it, or what should we do, do you think? No, I think uh, if you can form some kind of organisation of sport, that can take youngsters away from having to roam the streets and take an interest in, in a new type of element, and I think must be some improvement on what they're doing at the present moment. I saw you enjoying yourself on, on yeah, the pigeon great, lane there. Great. How have you got on with it so far? Not too bad. I quite enjoy the target. It's the first time I've come along to shoot air rifles on a range like this. And Which part do you think's the best? Ooh. I don't know. It's hard to say, really. Well, it's, it's nice so, to see you hesitate. So much. You no, it's, it's been. Excellent. Good. So what's so different about this then? Well, it's set out good. Yeah. And like, you put the rabbits in that and the holes in that. You can test all the different kinds of air rifle. Good. And choose one to your uh, personal specification. Brilliant. How did you uh, how did you find the lamping lane there? It's uh, good fun. I've never been lamping before and it gave me an idea of what it, what it would involve. If you could name one key ingredient here that's been the, the absolute reason for its success, what would you say it was? The attitude really is uh, mainly, I think, of the people showing the guns, the people going through the ranges. It's a very friendly atmosphere. It's, it's competitive yet enjoyable, uh, which I think is what most people want. It's a horrible day outside, so I've decided to come into the workshop and try a bit of maintenance. Now this HW35 belongs to a mate of mine, and now he's been complaining it's been losing power. Now I've checked the obvious things like the spring, it's not broken, the piston seal, it's not scorched, it's not burnt or anything. So what I, th I now think it is, is the breech seal. Now the breech seal is this little thing here. It's a synthetic o-ring which forms an airtight seal behind the pellet and seals the breech to the cylinder. Now there is one way you can test to see if a breech seal is actually leaking. Now that's to sprinkle Tolkien powder all along the joints here. Any air that's leaking is going to reveal itself a little plume of dust. Now I tried it, but the recoil of the gun was such that when you f pulled the trigger, the talc went everywhere and it didn't really, re didn't really reveal anything that was worth watching. The other problem with talc is if you mix it with oil, it's going to make a very serviceable grinding paste which will ruin your breech jaws. To be honest, I wouldn't really bother with talc. For a couple of quid, replace the breech seal and that's all there is to it. Just dead simple. Right, I'll show you how to change it now. Use a precision screwdriver to prise the old seal out. Be gentle and work around the outside of the seal. 
Yep, I was right. It was split. After you've taken the old seal out, pop the new one in. It's a push fit, dead easy. Job done. Brocock are the air cartridge specialists. One cartridge, 12 guns, no comparison. When it comes to new products, there's not much newer than the Air Arms RN10. This is a prototype version which Air Arms gave to me when they asked me to do some field trials with it. Now I've suggested a few modifications, some will be retained, some won't. They may keep the angled butt pad, they may make the fore end deeper. I know for a fact they're going to keep the slotted muzzle brake and they will retain the ability to remove the cylinder, the charging and the little pressure gauge in the end of it. The elongated scope rail is definitely going to stay. The match trigger unit is virtually faultless. I certainly couldn't find anything wrong with it. And the compatibility for left or right hand loading is a must. The stock is laminate, very, very strong. All sorts of adjustability, a very good feature. We're going to visit the Air Arms factory in the next issue, so look out for the review on the RN10 as soon as we've completed tests on the production model. One new item leads to another. This is the PM110 chronograph. Air Arms use this to test all their guns, including the RN10. This is the club model, but Air Arms and other factories use the full Monty, which is connected to a shot analysis computer and a printer, and you can store up to 200 shots. For club use, this one will give you strings of 10 shots, which you can examine for muzzle weight, variance, overall variance, high shot, low shot. It's an extremely sophisticated piece of kit. It's even got a self-check device on it. If you mess up when you're firing through here, if you don't go over the sensors directly, it will tell you that you are indeed a bad shot. It clears itself and you get another go at it. Once it's been plugged in for about five minutes and you haven't used it, it'll save its own battery and switch itself off. Another touch of the keyboard will turn it back on. It's about 150 quid and for that you get superb instructions, an excellent piece of kit there and inside here are all the pellet weights you'll need to program into the machine. Chronographs are essential for club use. They keep you legal, they keep the rifles performing as they should. If you're going to get a chrono, do your homework, there are a few about, study what's on offer and buy a good one. I've just come up to the uh, Theoban factory at St Ives near Cambridge to have a look around the factory and to have my rifle serviced. So let's go inside and meet Ben and Dave. Dave, Ben, uh, what persuaded you to get into the business of manufacturing air rifles in the first place? I think it was uh, uh, our interest in shooting and we made some air rifles for our own use and then um, Ben thought about putting a gas ram into what was a coil spring type gun. We then applied for a patent and after that it was spending real money. So, you know, on, on to Ben. On. Yeah, we, we uh, went to a couple of manufacturers who we couldn't really interest um, in the device and decided that the, you know, the money we had spent had better be followed up with some more and better get into making them ourselves. Were you engineers before you started out this venture? Well, Dave was in the aircraft industry, um, uh, mainly milling. I was in the motor industry, mainly men in motor cars. But uh, you, know, you get to see a lot of things and gives you ideas. So, hence the air gun. It's quite a big leap, isn't it? I mean, especially financially for two people on their own. Yeah, we Did just raised get... the money and away we went. Yeah. People thought we were crazy, you know. <laughs> Secure employment and then suddenly you're going to make air rifles, you know. Yeah. <laughs> How long ago was that then? It's Twelve years ago. Twelve years. Yes. And uh, you've done quite a few rifles now, haven't you? Different models. We've done a lot of models. I think we've actually made about 10,000 rifles uh, in that time. 10,000? Mm-hmm. Do you manufacture everything on the premises here, or do you buy anything in? Uh, we manufacture a, a major part of the brake barrel rifles, but we um, buy in the rifle stocks and um, barrels from Anschutz in uh, Germany. Um, and on the Rapid 7, um, we buy in the, uh, the Rapid 7 body, which is all made on a CNC machine in a neighbouring factory. 
Um, in fact, it's uh, the factory where Ben and I first started up. We had one corner of that factory um, nine, in 1982, um, and it's an old school friend of mine who runs the show, and it's still nice to do business with him. Um, the, uh, the material is brought in in uh, blocks, which goes onto their CNC machine, um, multi-tool changes, and uh, they um, are able to machine to very, very tight limits and keep the consistency from one batch to another absolutely spot on. They have very advanced um, inspection as well, so we know that we're buying the stuff in the right place. Dave, you, you told us how the Rapid 7 is produced. How about the gas ram guns? Uh, right, well, we organise that in uh, batches of 300, and we buy insufficient material um, to do that. Uh, with um, the centre lathe work, milling, um, there's welding, all the processes um, we're able to do in-house with our very skilled staff. Uh, there's ten of us all in all. And it's all self-checking. Uh, each individual knows that it's got to be for a product that's got to work at the end of the day. So we have lots of self-inspection on uh, as the stuff is produced. Um, we have developed up our own method of um, welding uh, using basically an old converted lathe that runs uh, I think it's about 10 second cycle on, on the radial welding. Uh, this process has been picked up by Hastings Ed by one or two other um, air rifle manufacturers but it's a very convenient way of uh, joining uh, tube stock to uh, solid um, materials. Um, we have to achieve a very high finish with the van rifles Hence, a lot of emphasis is on uh, ground finish, which then goes on to hand polishing. A lot of uh, work, a lot of sweat and muscle work goes into achieving uh, that. Um, and of course, the, the blacking plant is something else which um, you know, people expect on, on expensive air rifles to get a, a high finish of uh, uh, blacking. So we have our own plant for doing that as well. What are your uh, plans for the future of the gas ram system? Firearc have uh, been licensed some time ago to make the HW90. Um, I think there's possibly a new gun coming from them. But uh, one of the other things we do uh, is make a, um, a power unit that you can fit yourself to BSAs, Webleys, Air Arms, and possibly others later on, um, which gives it much more flexibility. Does it smooth out any recoil? Oh yeah, it's yes, much, much nicer yeah. to shoot. It's got less recoil and it's much quieter, more consistent, more accurate. Um, I have heard that uh, it's rather hard to get hold of Theoban rifles at times. Um, you did say earlier you, you were moving factory at some time. Well, that's one of the reasons for moving is to get more production. But uh, the real reason is we do a, quite a large range of guns for such a small company and they're all individually finished off and made for the customer. So it's going to be time, always. It's never off the shelf. Well, this is what we hope, that we're looking to move to a factory that's three times the size of what we've currently got. And uh, that way we will um, be able to get some more machinery, hopefully some more people, and uh, really uh, get the rifles flowing so that people don't have to uh, wait two months or so for a gun. And the prices will come down? <laughs> the variety of um, potential for guns will go up. <laughs> well, Dave and Ben, thanks very much for letting us have a look around your factory. And I hope you have enjoyed this rather informative trip round Theoban. On our next video, we'll be looking at the premises of another well-known air rifle manufacturer. See you then. So what happened there then? Well, the action moved, but the butt didn't. That means it's nearly recoilless. This is the Diana Model 54 Air King from RWS. Outwardly, not much different than the Model 52, but they've mounted the action on a sledge. So the recoil's absorbed in here and not around here. Actually, this looks a big hefty gun and it feels quite hefty, but a lot of the stuff inside here is hollow and that makes it sound a little bit boxy because it acts like an echo chamber. As you can see it's the same massive side lever as the 52 and it's got all the safety components but 
I have to say, I don't like the feeling of letting that lever go while I put a pellet in. And this rifle is designed to be loaded from the right hand side, so you can't really avoid it. You can decock the gun with a bit of sort of finger gymnastics, but uh, I don't like to do that. I would much rather hold the lever. You've got a safety slide here and this massive sharp tooth piston holder here. You've got a manual safety and a superb trigger unit, but as I say, I still don't like letting that lever swing. Anyway, it's the design in the shooting that really makes a difference to this thing. It's mounted on the sledge, but the trigger isn't. So when you pull the, the trigger, it'll come back with you. You don't even notice it, actually. You don't notice anything at all. The thing really does feel recoilless. It's extremely accurate, even though I've been very daring and not put a telescopic sight on it. The open sights are superb. You can adjust the front one on a ramp and the rear one is adjustable for windage and elevation. It's an excellent unit. You can even interchange the notch to get the notch post alignment that suits you best. Stock is beach with a rubber recoil cap. Trigger is two stage and adjustable. And the whole thing is a well-made, well-engineered package from Germany that keeps to the usual high standards. I like it. It's a real rival to Air Arms SI. And if you like this big, chunky sort of feel, I think you'll be going for this one. Egan's in Action News Desk, we've just heard of an amazing money-saving idea from Prometheus Pallets. Normally supplied like this, they're now available in kit form like this. Before the latest development, expensive machinery is used to bring the heads and skirts together. Now, you replace the middleman and Prometheus pass on the saving to you. Instead of 85 Z2 pellets, you now get 400 for the same price. £4.50. A similar deal available on the Z1. Now that's what we call news. The two great advances in modern air gun shooting have been the pre-charge rifle and the high magnification scope. This isn't just a sight, it's a system. What started life as a six and a half to twenty times scope has been converted into a range finding and pellet placement system. I'll talk you through it. Starting at the back, we have a sunshade. That'll stop the backlight, stop the glare and keep everything sharp in front of the eye. Moving forward is the main change in the scope. This little device here is an image booster. It's, it's pushed the magnification up to a factor of two. I now have 14 and a half to 35 times mag. In front of that sits a spirit level. There's one on the scope and I have one on the rifle, so I can keep track of the spirit level bubble at all times. This keeps the rifle upright and the pellets flying straight. In front of that, you'll see a temperature gauge. This only comes into play in extremes of temperature when the image system inside is likely to be distorted by heat or extreme cold. We have quality mounts holding the whole thing together. This is so important. At the front is the focal mechanism. This is what builds the range finding ability. In front of that is a sunshade to which is attached a close range adapter, which will compensate for the high mag and allow me to bring targets in right down to 10 yards on full magnification. The center of it all is this thing here. This is the focusing collar. By focusing on my target correctly, I can tell where it is to within a yard. It's all very high tech and the hunters out there must be thinking, well, that's got nothing to do with me, but you're wrong. This is a modern hunting scope. And if you look closely, there's not really that much difference. It goes from six to 18 mag and has a front focusing lens, the same as this one. There's a system we use in the field target world that hunters can certainly benef benefit from. Hunters judge range by eye. They make decisions on yardage of their targets and take them when they fire at it. If you see a rabbit and you say it's 35 yards, 
you set this scope at 35 yards, full magnification. If that rabbit is in sharp focus, then you've made the right decision and you can take the shot. If the rabbit is fuzzy, you've made the wrong decision and shouldn't be taking the shot. It's a good system. It trains you, makes you a more responsible hunter. The field target boys are interested only in points, prizes and hitting their targets once, one shot every time. The important thing to know is how to use all this technology and get the most out of it. The first thing you need is a stable platform. I've got the rifle sitting firmly on my knee and this stops it bouncing around and stops the image moving so you can notice slight changes in focus. Now, put your hand on the focus mechanism of the scope, locate the target and move the focus mechanism very gradually until the target is almost in focus. Then fine tune the focus by going through the focal point and past the other side until the movements become smaller and smaller until the image is absolutely perfect. Then you've got the correct focal point. That all sounds fairly involved and complicated. Well, it isn't. In a field target competition, you have two targets to handle in two minutes and you can recheck your parallaxing about four times for each target if you want. There are some things that can go wrong though. The first one is if the target is silhouetted against the sky. This can be a real problem. Your eye tries to focus on the sky and you're trying to focus the scope on the target. What you need to do then is to either focus on something very close to the target like the base or the tree it's attached to or swing round and focus on an object of exactly the same range. It's not as hard as you might imagine. The other thing that can go wrong is you trying too hard. If you're nervous or jumpy at all, you will try to focus when it isn't really in focus. If your eyes are good, they will override the focal mechanism of the scope. Just relax, move the scope's focal mechanism smoothly and let the scope do the work. That's the way to get the most out of what you paid for. Targettronics have slashed their chrono prices for Christmas. The PM1 is now £99, the PM110 is just £119. Targettronics, test with the best. The farmer's asked me to come up here and uh, cull some of his collard doves because at this time of year, just after harvest, these, there's so much corn around the farmyards that the, the collared doves flock here and they pollute the corn that the man would like to sell. Now, as you can see, this, all the white bits in here, it's been well crushed by the farm machinery, which makes it nice and palatable. And because it's been crushed, as soon as you get a bit of rain on here, it gets nice and soft and the birds love it. And there's loads and loads and loads of it. But this isn't necessarily the best time of year to shoot collared doves. Um, by far the best, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, late January, February time, or after Christmas, really, because by then there's no leaves on the trees. You can easily see the birds when they're perched. Uh, the cover is, all the nettles and brambles have died right back, so when you do drop a bird, you can instantly retrieve it without having to send the dogs in to ferret around for it. And uh, another thing is that those two months, January, February, there's very little food for them out on the stubble fields. Um, at the moment, there are quite a few birds still out feeding on the stubbles and around the hedgerows. But in winter, they all flock to the easiest place where there's plenty of food. <clears throat> and there'll be corn, there'll be corn tailings, there'll be bits of corn all around here. Well, there always is, really, 12 months a year. So I'm going to now go and thin out the dove population a bit. Couple of those geese. That's worth getting up early for, isn't it? One of the important things of uh, when you're going around a farm, if you're right-handed, go around anti-clockwise. Then the rifle appears before you do when you get around the corner. Up in that tree there.
This is where I hit the wire. Oh. You gonna stay there long enough? Now, I've marked where it's fallen, so I'm going to pick it. They may look tiny little birds, but the breast meat is absolutely delicious. If I was just to uh, toss that in there, now it's a bit thicker. He'd be forever trying to find it. <clears throat> this went straight through the heart. Whoops. And judging by the feel of his breast, he hasn't started feeding yet, so uh, I could probably spend all day here shooting dozens. There's lots of places I can hide in all these bushes and undergrowth here. But actually, the collared dove's got pretty sharp eyes, so you've got to make sure that you do stay fairly concealed. The thing about that bird on the wire was that uh, the wire itself was right in line with its heart, so I had to move slightly to one side. And obviously, there's that car there, which I could use as a uh, rest. And the thing is, you've got to call their bluff to a certain extent, because they see quite a lot of people around farmyards, and they, but they know that people can be a bit dodgy, especially when they're armed with one of these things. So uh, you saw his head going to and fro, saying, shall I fly, shall I fly? No. And uh, I was able to call his bluff, get into a nice position, and shoot him clean. Although collared doves uh, breed throughout the year, there's lots of youngsters around this time of year, and they just can't believe that people are shooting at them. And this is a classic example of good collared dove habitat. They've got these nice fir trees for them to nest in. And in fact, there's only two or three firs, but they're full of nests, and these ivy trees as well. Sometimes you get a big old crow sitting out here, but obviously not today. Oh, well. It does flying around all over the place at the moment. Well, I'm going to use that lorry as a rest, if possible. See if I can call their bluff again. Now, which one shall I shoot? I'm partially obscured by twigs. I'm going to try and shoot through the fork in the tree when his head gets there. Well, I hit the tree. <laughs> if we wait here, you'll get some more coming in. This is classic Dove City, this is, because of the uh, bare branches. Now, this sort of range, which is about 25 yards, I suppose, is ideal for any. A uh, reasonably powerful air rifle. We've got a fairly feeble quarry, the collared dove, and then they don't have thick um, feathers, and you can hit them practically anywhere in the chest, and they're dead. Headshots are a bit tricky because the head's so tiny. It's amazing you get collared doves absolutely everywhere throughout the British Isles, but they've only been here since 1953, and that is what. Um, about the same time as mixed mitosis broke out. But nowadays you find them throughout the entire British Isles and even up in Shetland, and they must have flown across the sea. There's only two tiny little woods in Shetland, or the Shetland Islands, and they are populated by collared doves, not wood pigeons. Oh, there we go. That's a tricky one. Look at those twigs around it. Well, that sorted out a few of the doves on this farm. 
they certainly won't be robbing the farmer of his corn anymore. There's enough there for a nice little meal, because they do taste delicious, because they're corn fed. And next time, we'll be after a different quarry species. We'll see you then. Tasco, the world's number one best-selling range of rifle scopes, is available from Deben. Deben, our aim is your satisfaction. Here it is, the new Webley Nemesis pistol. The first entirely new pistol Webley have launched since the late 70s, I believe. It's certainly a radical departure from the lines of the Typhoon and the Tempest. For a start, it's a single stroke pneumatic. The other thing it uses that they didn't is extensive modern polymers and plastics. Now this will upset a few traditionalists, but I can see the sense of it. This is a modern pistol and they've used modern components. Where polymers do a better job than metal, they've been incorporated. Where they don't, Webley have stuck to the traditional tools and manufacturing methods. For instance, all hinge pins are steel and they're retained with steel circlips. The trigger is polished alloy as well. Composite grips and this lovely little real gold plated medallion in the grip face. What looks like a hammer is in fact the cocking lever release. By pulling it back, giving it a little upward tug there, you release the barrel shroud and cocking lever. Open it right out, put a pellet in the barrel there, plenty of room to do that. Notice how nicely sealed and held it is, and close it. Now, before I do that, I'll point out one of the things I dislike. This is the safety lever. That button should be automatically set as you open it up. I know it would cost more money, but I would prefer it that way. This time I'm going to set it manually. I'll move the pistol to a safe position, pointing to the ground, and close the lever. The effort is minimal. It's nothing a 12-year-old couldn't get his hands around. Just disengage the safety, take the pressure on the trigger, and release the shot. Trigger's a two-stage design, adjustable down to about three pounds very serviceable in use. The Webley Nemesis has an adjustable rear sight which you can adjust for windage and elevation and it's fitted with scope grooves if you want to fit a pistol scope or a red dot sight. Overall the Webley Nemesis is a well thought out well designed project which really puts Webley in the 90s. I think a lot of people are going to go for this little gun and at the price they've set it I think it's going to be really competitive in the pistol market. Well done Webley. When we air gunners put a pellet in our rifle, we assume that that pellet will come out of the muzzle in exactly the same shape and form as when it went in. But this isn't always true because very often, and particularly in higher powered rifles, the pellet is deformed in the barrel. It is expanded or compressed and if it has any weaknesses in it then they will show up by the pellet being distorted. So to check on this problem, the only thing we can do is to catch that pellet at some point down range. And we have obviously got to catch it without any further damage uh, to it than, than was perhaps done within the barrel. So we've found two ways, each has its own pros and cons of catching these pellets. And the first is in ordinary uh, kitchen table jelly. Um, but we mix it with twice as much jelly as recommended on the packet so that we get a stiffer solution. The advantages of the jelly are that the pellet is very easy to fish out and uh, it's, it, it's a quick system. And if you're going to do a test a, a, a number of um, 
brands of pellets in your rifle one afternoon, then that is the ideal system. The other system is by firing the pellet into polyester wadding. The drawback of the polyester is that it does take a certain amount of time to sort the pellet out from the wadding. Um, it's a bit tedious, but it's well worth it in the long run. So now we've got the gelatin, which we've cut out earlier on, and on the bench here, ready for the test. Behind it, we have a pellet stop for safety. It's just a, a cardboard box stuffed with rag and newspaper. And we're going to test four types of pellet, the flat face, the round or dome head, the pointed, and the paragon. Now the paragon pellet we're going to test not so much for distortion because an air rifle won't, or normal air rifle, won't distort a paragon pellet. But we are testing it for penetration because obviously the gelatin is a very good indicator of the penetrative power of any given pellet. So right now, let's give it a go. Well, there we are. That's the four pellets fired. And you will see that the paragon is the only one that has gone straight the way through the gelatin and into the backstop. This emphasizes the necessity to have a very good firm backstop on these occasions. Now, if you find that your pellets are going fairly near the end of the gelatin, then it is better to remix the gelatin with more of the jelly in it and or alternatively find a longer lemonade bottle in which to cast the uh, jelly. So now that completes that. It is now just a matter of fishing the pellets out of the gelatin for examination. I've fired them, I've collected them, now I'll give them a quick wash and then on the next video you will see what happens when I put them into my pellet flying machine. I've just heard it through the grapevine that a major air gun trader has commissioned what can only be described as a super gun. Details are sparse but we do know that it will be a spring piston designed built to the highest spec imaginable and dressed in an exhibition grade walnut stock. We're talking at least four grand. When we find out some more, we'll talk some more. Muses it breaks, air guns in action. Prometheus gives shooters the ability to discover their true potential. Prometheus, the world leader without being led. If we had a strange but true category on air guns in action, this thing would be in it. It's the Venom TDR, which means takedown rifle. What takes down can be put back together. You need a barrel, which Venom build with a big fat silencer on the end of it. You need a stock, which you unfold from there. Tighten up on the big brass screws there. There's two of those. They index, which holds the stock fairly firmly, but not as firm as I'd like, to be honest. Unfold the butt pad, lock it in, whip out your scope, slide that on, give it a lock up, just like that. Nip it up with a custom built two pence piece, and you're ready to roll. A few shots later, I should be zeroed and up and running. Holds quite positively. Feels fairly tight on the face with the metal contact as it is, but as an air gun, it works. And the reason it works is because Venom tuned the inside quite extensively. What started life as a Webley XL 
is now a highly tuned piece of kit. And it would need to be because it costs 250 quid depending on what you have done to it. It was commissioned by a fisherman who wanted something he could fold up and put inside a specially built case because these things are still subject to the same laws as anything else. And Venom built in one and their other customers have taken an interest. If you fancy something that looks like this, give Venom Arms a call. This is the new age of air rifles from Air Arms. Every component is produced by skilled staff using the latest laser and computer controlled technology. All Air Arms rifles are individually tested to ensure peak performance. Air Arms, the best sporting air rifles in the world, and that's guaranteed. I'm often asked about barrel cleaning. Now some barrels benefit from cleaning more than others. Spring guns can keep themselves clean by spraying tiny particles of oil up the bore, which helps to lubricate them and keep them rust free. Pump ups and precharge don't do this. They can suffer from condensation, which can cause rust in the bore. The thing to remember when cleaning an air gun barrel is don't do more harm than good. Don't scratch the rifling, and especially don't damage the crown. I use a plastic coated conga trace bought from a local tackle shop. Use a drinking straw to guide the trace clear of any silencer. When the trace appears at the breech, open the loop and thread through a piece of special barrel cleaning cloth. The knot in the trace helps to press it into the rifling. Give it a spray with the barrel cleaning agent and gently pull it back towards the muzzle. Two runs through with this removes the muck and leaves a protective film to keep the rust away. This rifling has never been cleaned and it's certainly due for it. Any muck in there is bound to affect the accuracy. Remember, if your barrel's not doing its job, your gun won't either, so look after it. Theoban Engineering, developers of the gas ram system, now bring you the new Fenman and Taunus rifles. For an information pack on these and the rest of the range, just send a stamped addressed envelope to Theoban. If I had to name my all-time favourite air gun, this would be it. The BSA Air Sporter Mark I, and what a beautiful thing she is. It's only about 10 years younger than this old tractor here, but I think you'll agree it's slightly less agricultural. Look at the lines of it, pure sporting. And I don't think there's been a prettier gun produced even today. Mechanically, it was very efficient. The underlever was easy to cock, full length. And it also brought up the loading tap. It was easy to decock, and the underlever clipped unobtrusively straight into the stock. Didn't stick out, didn't look ugly. You only had open sights, so uh, this was the gun that I learned my trade with, and I learned from the bottom, you could say. No scope grooves, you see, you couldn't fit a scope. Trigger was very functional. Two stage, sporting design, no butt cap. No frills, just style. This one's not in too great a condition, but all the bumps and scratches and knocks and marks, they all represent memories to me, and I, I know where they happened and where I was and how I felt, and she's a walk down memory lane just to pick it up and clean it, this old gun. BSA moved from this design to a boxy square-shaped thing with uh, a butt pad and bits of plastic on it that I didn't fall in love with at all. But I'm pleased to say that as the years went past, they recognised the impact the Air Sporter Mark I made and the new RB Air Sporters now look almost identical to this and are much the better for it. I hope, as an air gun enthusiast, we will always be able to buy air guns with this amount of pure style. How do expert shooters do what some of us only dream about? They learn their trade from the ground up. Nothing is left to chance. Experts study the systems of success, from trigger to muzzle. They research the art of rangefinding and trajectory, and they do all this safely and effectively. Now you can become an expert because you'll have no excuses.
When the shooting day is done, those who have a life go out and enjoy themselves. Those who don't sit at home and wash pellets. It's a desperately interesting little procedure which everybody should learn and I'm going to teach it to you now. Your basic jam jar filled with water takes the pellets thusly and a little squirt of fairy liquid. Put the lid on tight, watertight, and give them a good shake around. Now you should carry on doing this for about two minutes. What we're trying to do here is loosen all the little particles of lead and swarf that you will see floating down to the bottom. That's the stuff we want to get out. The little tiny bits of lead that will block up your rifling and ruin the accuracy of your air gun. When this is finished, take a sieve, put it over a bowl and tip your pellets in. Rinse the pellets off with some fresh water to flush the particles through and to get rid of all the soap suds. Don't use a sieve that you're going to use in the sink again or throughout the kitchen because it's full of lead, okay? That same goes for the bowl. Don't do this in the sink. You'll get in big trouble and you'll get me in bigger trouble. When they're drained through, Okay. That goes on for about three minutes and it's desperately boring. But when they are dry, and I mean dry, because if you leave them damp, they'll oxidise, which means they all go all white and furry and they'll be absolutely useless. Tip them out on some absorbent paper. Try and keep them on the paper if you can. Spread them out and now just look for any deformed ones. Pick them out and throw them away. When they're perfectly dry, you can apply your lubricant or whatever it is you fancy putting on them. All you have to do then is about two hours worth of weighing and sizing and then your pellets are okay and come to think of it we are fairly sad aren't we really well that's the end of the first one didn't seem like an hour did it that's because time goes quickly when you're having fun there's plenty there for you to practice and study and watch again before you go away and do that Here's a taster of what's going to happen in issue two of Air Guns in Action. of comparing a pellet brand new out of the tin with one that's been fired from a rifle of too high a velocity. affect the apparent weight by adjusting for the length of pull through a hole in the trigger guard and accessing these screws. It's a very good system. And it's a very good plane as well. Made of polymer, as are the grips. The main pistol frame is alloy. That was Steve's mobile phone, for which you will pay a £20 fine. There you go, nothing staggeringly vulnerable. The only problem you're going to have is contamination. Webley assembled this thing from start to finish. <laughs> 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 from
Prometheus will now supply them available in kit form, like this. Before the latest development, <laughs> Here at the Airguns in Action News Desk, we've just heard of an amazing money saving idea from Prometheus. And it's. Have some hay, Terry, sit down. And... You look closely, the whole thing can go backwards and forwards. Otherwise, it's fairly standard. Same massive side lever. I haven't said what it is yet. What a twat. I've seen coloured doves sitting on eggs in snow on several occasions. In nests in snow. <laughs> now I tried this, but all I found was the recoil was such that it just pushed all the talcum powder all over the gun and didn't reveal anything that was worth watching. <sighs> okay. There's no way you can cut this, is there? No. Okay. Is there something happening outside? There's an awful lot of, There's no, a chicken. OK. Now, you can try the old talcum powder trick. Now that's where you sprinkle talcum powder all around the breech jaws here. And when the gun fires, any air that's leaking out of the back of the breech seal is going to reveal itself with a little plume of dust. Now, I tried this, but all that happened was the dust... Oh, damn. OK, OK. That chicken's putting me off, to us. <laughs> Those who have a life go out and enjoy themselves, those who don't, sit at home and wash pellets. It's a desperately fruitful little procedure and it doesn't cost a penny. Here's how you do it. Get your pellets, get your jam jar, tip pellets into the water. Knock the sieve off and say, <laughs> <laughs>